Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Book Goodies, the podcast by authors for authors. I'm your host, Deborah Carney, and I am joined today by meteorite man, Jeff Notkin. Hi, Jeff. How are you? I'm great, Deborah. It's terrific to be on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, you... As we discussed pre-show, I think we're going to have a few shows with you because you have so much interesting stuff that we can talk about. Um, why don't we start out uh, int- uh, giving some the people some background on yourself and how you were born in the U.S. and you ended up with an English accent. Yeah, I've had a pretty colorful life. I, I was born on 14th Street in New York City, and my parents were were international travelers and spent most of their lives in Europe, and they moved to London shortly after I was born. So even though I've always been an American citizen, I'm, I'm often thought of as oh, the English science guy, the English meteorite guy. So then in my 20s, I moved back to the States and lived in New York and Boston and now make my home in the lovely small city of Tucson, Arizona, which is a, is about as different as rainy old London as I could find. <laughs> <laughs> a, good, a good change, though, but I, I do miss London. And I am a science writer, as you know, and a columnist. I'm host of the television series Meteorite Men on Science Channel, which is an adventure series in which my co-host Steve Arnold and I travel the earth, often to some of the scariest places we can find in search for rocks that have fallen out of the sky and and meteorites are among the rarest things that exist on our planet and they didn't even originate here which makes it even more interesting that's really that's that's really fascinating let me interrupt you for one moment um as i had told you before the call we have a co-host and she just happens to have just come online so let's add her into the call so she can hear all this fascinating uh, stuff too, and we're all fascinated about meteorites. So, let me fantastic. Just add Karen in. The more, the merrier. Yes. <laughs> and we're very laid back on our podcast, as you can tell. So we aren't all um, stiff and formal, and got to start all over again because we're adding somebody in. See, I like you already, and I do live in the most laid back city in America. So, <laughs> hi, Karen. Hello. Hello, uh, Karen. We, Hello. Um, we already warned our visitors that, or our listeners that we were adding in a second host. So ah. um, we are <laughs> talking to Jeff, uh, TV star of Meteorite Men, and he was just getting started talking about that TV series. So fantastic. Uh, say hi to everybody, Karen, and we'll continue on. Hello, I'm Karen. Um, if you've been listening lately, then you know who I am already. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome aboard. I'm just glad you could join us. Me too. Okay, so, so Jeff, continue with your story. Certainly. So I have I've been fascinated uh, with almost all aspects of science since since I was a kid, and I went to a very strict British school in South London that was that really focused on science. And then after the equivalent of high school in the UK, I went straight into a geology position in London pr- before college. And so I, I had this this love of science as a kid, and then I went into the strictures of lab work and and found it didn't really suit me because I, I'm, an, I'm an outdoors guy and I'm a bit of an adventurer and a bit unconventional. And instead of sitting in the lab analyzing things, I wanted to be out in the boonies finding rocks and fossils. So I, I changed my direction and I, I became a field person and a collector. And... I think my my process of becoming a published writer has its roots in in that love of adventure and traveling to strange places and meeting colorful people. So about 20 years ago, I started writing articles for various science magazines, particularly with a focus on, on meteorites, paleontology and astronomy, which are my great interests. And my, my newest book, which is called Rockstar Adventures of a Meteorite Man, grew out of those articles and I went through this rather odd process where uh, after I'd had 15 or 20 articles published primarily about my adventures in in search of meteorites I thought well well I'm gonna collect those and and put them in a book because many of the magazines I wrote for were science periodicals or they were subscription only and some of them were out of print. The publisher was very supportive. So I started collecting them and I thought, ah, this doesn't really work with that one. I need to rewrite that a bit. And then (laughs) I thought, well, if I'm going to go to the trouble of republishing the articles, I might as well 
do a bit about my childhood and how I first became interested in meteorites. And so uh, this process unfolded for many years. And of course, as I was writing the book, I was then still having new adventures. New adventures, yeah. I know. So mm-hmm. it, was, it, was, it was sort of like a, um, a perpetual motion machine. I, I, I'd have 12 chapters done and go, well, it's looking pretty good. And, and then my co-host on, on the Meteorite Men show, Steve, would call up and go, hey, Jeff, we should go. We're going to Chile or we're going to Australia. Or I've made this huge discovery in Kansas. And I go, oh, new chapter for the book. <laughs> so so this, this fairly um, – amusing and sometimes frustrating process went on for 14 years. Wow. That's and a I, long time. I, yeah. I kept adding more things and, and then we were given this amazing offer to star in a, in a television documentary series about our work with meteorites. So then I was faced with the really uh, stern issue, which was, well, I can't publish the book without talking about the TV show because people will watch the TV show and, and buy the book and go, oh, I want to hear all the behind the scenes stories about the TV show. And then there's nothing in it about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, of course, that is that is not the case. The, the later parts of the book talk about about Meteorite Men and, and the numerous other television shows that I've done for for History Channel and TLC, Travel Channel, Nat Geo. I've participated in a lot of science documentaries. And so isn't, the, it, isn't it fascinating that with the technology today and with the advances in cable television, uh, 20 years ago, you know, there were barely more than four TV stations, you know, or was it 30 now? I'm, it's 30. I'm dating myself. <laughs> so, but still, even 20 years ago when they were, you know, History Channel was coming up, there still weren't, you know, there still wasn't TLC yet. And, you know, it's like the last 25 years, the cable TV has exploded, which has allowed you to be in a situation where you can do shows that aren't on the mainstream channels, but they're channels that everybody watches now. You know, I mean, we watch History Channel more than we watch ABC. And- it's a it's a great point, and and I I feel that Science Channel is such a good home for our show because there's a lot of science in it, but there's a lot of humor as well. Steve and I are very different people, and we, we have a an odd rapport, and we're 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 goofy. We we have very wacky <laughs> sense of humor, and mm-hmm. we've been the, something that a lot of people who've watched the show don't know is that Steve and I have been friends and and have been working together for eighteen years. Wow! So it's it's not one of those constructs where some network goes, oh, let's put these two guys together and do a funny show. They they wanted to do a show about our lives, mm-hmm. and you're so right. 10 or 15 years ago you couldn't have done it really and I was I was amazed and delighted that our network had had the courage to to develop such an unusual show I think most people that I've encountered in my work go oh meteorites wow really from outer space that sounds cool can I see one <laughs> but but most people have not encountered meteorites in their day to day lives unless their car happens to have been hit by one so they, they took a big chance with us and and the show's been very successful and it's airing internationally in many markets we're, we're airing in Australia and the UK Germany all over the place and it 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 fascinates me that so many of our viewers are younger. Uh, we have a we have a huge block of viewers who are, who are I'd say under twelve. And we one of the amusing things that's happened is a series of emails from parents who write and say thank you so much for getting my kids interested in science and all they were doing was playing video games before and now they want to be meteorite hunters. So it's not every day that a television show actually inspires kids to learn. And if if I look back at my career and go, well, I did one good thing, it would be that. I'm I'm very proud and also humbled that we've we've had the opportunity to get kids to kind of look outside and go, wow, I want to go out and look for those weird rocks that those two goofy guys find. <laughs> well, you, you know, growing up, uh, you know, and, and this goes back to the whole, you know, uh, how television has has started to really branch out. You know, when I was a kid, the only science programming that was on, you know, cable television was the occasional Nova and then Mr. Wizard and then eventually Bill Nye. But that was kind of it. 
there wasn't a National Geographic channel. There wasn't. I mean, the History Channel came around later, yeah. um, you know, and, and all of those those things. The, you you might catch something occasionally that had a scientific bent to it, but there wasn't anything that was specifically science focused. And and the 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 other thing that I've I've just been as you've been talking, I've been sitting here thinking about that because I have I have three kids, and you know, my youngest is seven, and my oldest is twelve, and they're very much you know into science, into you know all of the 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 intricacies. Of of math and learning and, and which is fantastic. But it used to be that, you know, if you were going to see an educational program, it would be on the free channels on television. And oh, yes. Now it's like all the crap is on the free stuff. You, yeah. you, have to, you used to have to pay extra for Nickelodeon and Disney Channel and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and it's now it's just fluff. <laughs> and to find cool things like you is, is sometimes difficult. So I'm, I'm so glad that there are shows out there like that. Um, because for, for me as a parent, you know, m- instilling the love of what I like you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist. That's what my degree is. And I've got a physics degree and, and, and a math minor is difficult because my, kids don't want to listen to their parents. But they'll listen to the cool guy that's finding awesome stuff on, on, on the television. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so sound, you sound, you. <laughs> thank you. And you sound like a terrific mom. And, and the fact that your kids are interested in science and math is so important. And I do a lot of a lot of outreach work and and public appearances and, and book readings around the country. And I just returned from Vermont a couple of days ago where Steve, my co-host, and I were the keynote speakers at Stellafane, which is a, a wonderful astronomy and telescope expo that takes place on a mountaintop in Vermont every oh, August. I, want to go. <laughs> I cannot recommend this highly enough. And, and I'm, I'm a telescope enthusiast and I'm an astronomy mm-hmm. nut. But I think telescope and I think observatory indoors, very clean, guys with lab coats and polishing the dials and everything. And this was absolutely opposite. It was more like being at a folk festival than, than a science event. There, there are kids and dogs and people are camping and making bonfires. And people come from all over the world because the, the Springfield Telescope Makers Society that sponsors Stellafane, they own this hillside. It's private land, and people go and they set up their telescopes for the weekend, hundreds of them. And it's wow. very social. And people go, look, I've got my giant telescope set up, and we're looking at globular cluster M22. Who wants to have a look? And wow. so there's, this, there's this, this culture of sharing, and I, I brought my thing, and I want everybody to look through it. And now what, what's your telescope set up at? And I oh, found, I, I'm, I'm in. Where do I sign up? <laughs> Seriously, go to stellafane.org. It's S-T-E-L-L-A-F-A-N-E. It is one of the best events I've ever been to. And it was so friendly. And and you can you can see the joy in the eyes of these little kids mm. because, A, they get to go and camp for the weekend. And, mm. B, they get to hang out with cool science people. And they, they were giving a class in grinding mirrors for telescopes, how to, oh, actually, how to actually start building your own telescope. So uh, as... Uh, as a science nerd and a science fiction fan and an astronomy nut, mm. I, I was just in heaven. And, and <laughs> my, my co-host Steve is he's a very he's a great guy and he's very funny. And he's not quite as kind of wrapped up in in the science culture as I am. So he found it very amusing me expounding about how amazing this telescope was. And oh, look at this! Look at this nebula! And some of the some of the things we looked at, they look just like special effect shots from Star Trek. I, nice. I've, I've looked through a lot of telescopes in my life, but I really had never seen anything like that. And I kind of thought, oh, it's going to be a lot of old middle-aged guys, you know, walking around going, oh, yeah, look at this new lens I've got. But it wasn't. <laughs> it's people of all ages embracing this this very social activity, which I, I never really thought of stargazing as social, but it can be. And we can do the same for any science. And we can get kids excited about it by showing them. And I think that's why... So many young people are, are drawn to, to my meteorite men to television show because we go, look, this is how a detector works. We're searching for this meteorite here because we think it fell in this field thousands of years ago. And it, there's, there's kind of a step by step without being, without being um, too meticulous or, right, or, or, or preachy. We, 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 we wanted to make science fun and exciting because that's what. I feel it should be. And that's what fires me up. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I have another um, observation that you probably know this. I went to Sedona this um, this spring, and we took a trip to um, Antelope Canyon from Sedona to Antelope Canyon. And when you go on that trip up, um, not the not Route 17, but the you know the road that runs alongside it, 80 or 89, I think. Um, when we were getting near Flagstaff, our tour bus operator started saying, and Flagstaff is one of the only dark cities in the United States. And I'm like, what's a dark city? And he was telling that there was some, and I apologize for not knowing the details, maybe you do, there was some really famous astronomer that um, had declared that this was the best place to see the stars and that they have no lights on after dark. Well, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff right there. And, and first of all, I love Flagstaff. And my home city of Tucson is also a dark city. Okay. And so we have, we have a low light ordinance here, and that's because the United States National Observatory on Kitt Peak is situated southwest of Tucson. And when Kitt Peak was being designed and developed it's more than 50 years ago now I think there are a number of cities vied to have the observatory there mm-hmm. and Tucson won and as a result we are bound by this low light ordinance so I live a little way out of the city and it's it's still it's moderately fun. developed but there are no street lights here it's right. dark as anything at night and so the the person I think you're speaking of is Clyde Tumble who that was the discoverer right, yeah. of, of Pluto Yep. And the discovery was made at the magnificent Lowell Observatory in in Flagstaff, which has one of the most spectacular antique telescopes in the world. And interestingly enough, I'm speaking there next month nice. on um, on the 29th. I'm I'm doing a special presentation about my books and meteorites and so forth at the Lowell. So you need to bring me. You need to bring me as your personal photographer. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, let, let me let me call someone. We should. Be, you know what we need is is an airline that would just kind of sponsor all our things and we yeah. can fly together. There you go. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll put someone on that. So yeah. Here's here is a concrete example of how caring about science and, in particular, astronomy, can improve the environment. And I think we all like dark skies. And I am a member of the International Dark Sky Association. See, and, now I didn't even know that existed until we went to Antelope Canyon in in April because I wouldn't have never known that there was an actual organization that was trying to keep dark skies. And mm-hmm. I think that's fascinating. And Sedona was a dark sky city, um, but they had a, a disagreement there. Like half the city wanted street lights, and half the city <laughs> residents didn't want street lights. So what happened is the city council didn't make a decision, and the state came in and take over. And for safety reasons, because of the state ordinances, they have to put in lights, street lights. But they will be, like you said, they will be the low lights. And they're not going to be the bright street lights, so it still will maintain. I mean, that area is spectacular for their skies at night, and it's one of the reasons I loved uh, Southern Nevada. Was you know one of the this is this is the one thing I gave up by moving back to New York City because no matter where you live around here, you can't see you can see the moon. <laughs> well, I remember this vividly <laughs> from from my years in New York. And I think it was the winter before I moved out here to Tucson. It was, I think it was November of 2003. There was a spectacular Leonid meteor shower. And it, it was expected to be one of the best in decades. Mm-hmm. So fortunately, I, I had another kooky friend, science guy, artist, writer guy named Warren Stevens. And we said, look, I don't care how cold it is or what time it is in the morning. We're going to see this meteor shower. So we, we, we drove. We were actually at an arts event, a uh, late night kind of arts event party in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And we left at about one o'clock in the morning. We drove all the way out to Robert Moses State Park nice. with deck chairs. And we put our deck chairs on the beach at about two o'clock in the morning. And we stayed there until dawn. And it, it was a magnificent meteor shower. Wow. But I absolutely know what you're talking about. If if you're in the city or if you're in L.A. or Chicago and you want to do stargazing, it's not easy. <laughs> no, no, not at all. So. And in fact, I'll tell you a funny story about low light, if I may, yes. if I'm not if I'm not 
rabbiting on too long, as as we would say no, in the UK. No, we love listening. <laughs> Thanks. I'm I'm a great fan of the Kitt Peak Observatory that I, I mentioned earlier, the, the National Observatory of the United States, and it, it's about it's about 55 miles southwest of Tucson, on on a mountain top. It, it's it's really high up there, and there there's a fantastic collection of telescopes. It's not just one; there are numerous observatories, so you can do a nighttime viewing program where you drive up and they give you a, a, a little dinner and a tour of the observatories and a basic lesson in astronomy and then when it gets super dark you get to look through one of the big telescopes which is fantastic the funny part is because of the low light ordinance and because of the very sensitive instruments that they're using at kit peak you have to drive down the mountain on a really windy road in the dark with your car lights off I've done that. Not that you have. My. I did that in Mount Zion or, or in Zion National Park. Oh yes. I came from. We were going from Bryce to Las Vegas, and the road that we took didn't put us back on 15. It was a back road, and all of a sudden, you know, we've been driving down this windy, windy road, and all of a sudden, we're like, "That says welcome to Zion," and I said, "That." This, this is the end we don't want to be on in the dark. <laughs> and it was, Karen, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it is a single lane, mm-hmm. and there is a tunnel, and it is all hairpin turns, and the tunnel has no lights even during the day. The tunnel is dark. Yeah. And we went down, and uh, I had a, a 12-year-old in the car and, and his dad, and, like, they both, like, just held their breath. Jesse closed his eyes the whole way down. And I'm like, well, I can't close my eyes because if I do, we're going to be in big <laughs> You're trouble. Crash. So I'm oh, like, we got crazy. this. We've got this. We were in an SUV. You know, we had run it for, for the trip. And it was hair. I mean, you just, it was like it being in a New York City taxi cab. You just close your eyes and hope you get out. And you have to close your eyes and hold on to your seatbelt and pray. And pray. Yep. <laughs> and I didn't like driving down it during the day, let alone driving it at night and then wondering if a camper is going to be coming up, you know, because there's camping mm-hmm. inside the park, which is why You're the quite the adventurer. And, yeah. And Deborah, let me clarify that not only are there no street lights on Kit Peak, I mean we actually had to turn the car headlights off oh, and really? drive down in absolute darkness. And they have a lead vehicle okay. that you follow, and that has little, very dim red lights. But he but knows it, his way. <laughs> he, he knows his way. Uh, but it, it makes you want to stick really close to the lead vehicle. And I've done some pretty crazy things in my life, but driving down a mountainside in the dark with the headlights off was really up in the top ten. <laughs> Well, you're going to do it again because I'm going to come to Tucson and we're going to go. <laughs> Super. To we'll, the we'll, take you, we'll, we'll take you on a hair raising tour of all the most magnificent places where you can drive in the dark. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, well, you can drive anywhere in the dark. You just might not get where you think you might be going. <laughs> yeah, especially in the desert. You, uh-huh. you... I was going to say, especially if a boob comes through at the same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we've had we've had that experience oh, when no. we've been out we've been out meteorite hunting that we're we're driving the deep desert and and this happened actually notably when we were in Chile in South America in the Atacama Desert. And we were driving and driving, trying to get to the site, and it got dark, and we thought, oh, we probably shouldn't really drive much longer. Let's just camp here in this wash. And so we took the truck down in the wash, and we made a campfire and pitched our tents and had a lovely night. And then we we wake up in the morning, and the sun comes up, and we go, holy cow, where are we? And the what we were expecting to see, the mountains around us were not there at all. And oh, we, no. we had gone quite far off course, and we were wow. just deep, deep in the desert. This was before GPSs and everything. This was mm-hmm. back in the 90s. So, yeah, that's, it's a very weird experience to suddenly have daylight arrive in the desert, and you go, I am absolutely not where I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, the maps down there aren't very good either. We, right, right. We'd be, driving on, we'd be driving on roads that weren't on the maps, and then we'd go look for a road that was on the map and it didn't exist. So nice. there, there, there was a lot of kind of driving by the seat of your pants on that expedition. Oh, my goodness. That's exciting. That's and we did get a little off topic from the book, but I don't care because, <laughs> <laughs> like I said, Sorry. like I said at the beginning, is that, you know, our, our podcasts are very relaxed. And sharing the experiences you had that led up to the writing of the book or that, you know, that these are the things that happened while you were writing the book this is why people are fascinated by your book and want to go and read it. 
Oh, thank you. And um, I think that telling the stories is very conducive to um, having people want to go and read your stuff. And so if any of our listeners are, are, are not happy, you can leave me a message in the comments. But <laughs> I think this is totally fun because, like Karen said, you know, kids that are interested in science, you've got to present it to them in a in a fun way like you didn't want to sit in the lab because you know okay some kids like to sit in the lab and make things that go boom you know you can put chemicals together and make little bombs and whatever and and blow things up but you that's not what a lot of people want to do they want to they need to get out into the outdoors and we're so fascinated with space you know, and like you said before we went on air, Jeff, you said, I like to chase rocks that are on the earth that didn't start from being on the earth. And and that's that's totally fascinating. And the fact that it doesn't hit houses, they don't hit houses and they don't hit, you know, cars more often than they do. Uh, that again, that's that's also fascinating. It is. You know, this is something that, that's quite remarkable. People watch the show and they read my books and articles and they go, Wow, you always go to the scariest places to look for meteorites. Why is that? <laughs> and I mean, if I'm if I'm brutally honest, the the adventure is is part of the appeal. But most meteorites that we found and that we know of didn't land anywhere convenient. Yeah. And th- there is there's a notable exception. In 2003, there was a major meteorite fall over the suburbs of southern Chicago in the, the town that. of Park Forest. And it was witnessed by hundreds or thousands of people. And we flew out immediately. And, and between us, Steve and I found over 100 meteorites in a few days. And it was so funny because we're so used to being out in the Australian outback or in Siberia or in some absolutely um, windblown and remote place where you have to bring all your own supplies. And if anything goes wrong, you're, you're pretty much in trouble. And here we are in this very kind of sophisticated upper middle class neighborhood suburb and we go oh we're hungry hey we don't have to open up a can of beans we can just stop in this restaurant right here <laughs> you can just go downtown to Gino's, you know come yeah, on yeah <laughs> and, and hot water and bathrooms and everything it was very modern <laughs> and you could you could run around through people did you find yourself running through people's backyards going i see one i see one and and them coming out going what are you doing <laughs> well not without permission okay. and uh, we we really are very respectful of of landowners and this is something having lived in in new york where where people are very um, possessive of their their privacy uh mm-hmm. in one way and then living out here in arizona where people get a house way out in the desert on their own for a reason you know if, if you live out in the desert desert on your own it's probably because you like your quiet time mm-hmm. and a lot of people out here are armed and so you don't really want to just be wandering around <laughs> through people's property without checking first. So uh, partly because it's the right thing to do. And, and we, of course, partly respect because the law. you don't want to be shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And partly you don't want some guy coming out with a shotgun going, get out of my yard. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that would be car- that would be um, that would actually be kind of tough to find the boundaries, isn't it? Sometimes or do they all have? like you know big fences but a lot of arizona is so wide open well it's you make an excellent point and a a large part of our work is meticulous research so it's one thing for us to figure out where meteorites fell and then it's a completely different thing for us to get permission to go on that land and in this in the second season of my show meteorite men we we filmed an episode in utah southwest of Salt Lake City and an enormous fireball had been seen over over the city mm-hmm. in 2009 nighttime so bright that that it it, it set off um, light sensors okay. and and people witnessed it from from neighboring states as well so after a lot of calculations and research we discovered that if meteorites made it to the ground which we're certain they did they landed right in the middle of the dugway proving ground which is the most top secret military testing facility in the states Mm -hmm. and it's it's nicknamed area 52 so that range that testing range is almost the size of delaware and we had to go all the way to to the pentagon to get permission to search and it 
we had a fantastic relationship with the military. We, we worked very closely with the Air Force and the Army, and they sent uh, observers and unexploded ordnance experts out with us. So we get to do some really wacky things. We're walking around on this test range, and, and they've been <laughs> dropping bombs there since World War II. Yeah. So... We got you're you're looking, you're guys looking for, for essentially, yeah, you know, as a meteorite, you're looking for a, a rock. Yeah. And you have to have an unexploded ordnance specialist with you. That's terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> two. We had two specialists with us in case they disagreed. Side. In case they disagreed? Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. And just... we had an armed Marine escort out there, Marine officers, armed yeah. just wow. to make sure everyone behaved and perhaps <laughs> Did we didn't get attacked by a desert monster. Okay. No, but they, they were great guys and again it illustrates okay, gotta watch the, out for the sand people <laughs> yeah you know well you don't it know what a, they put out there <laughs> it know. looked a lot like Tatooine when we got out there really I was, oh. I was kind of expecting to see Luke going by in his, his sand uh, just don't forget your power converters right <laughs> nice <laughs> well, I can see that we're all Star Wars fans. That's really good. For you. Well, and, well, I had three kids during that time period, so Luke, I am and your I'm father. just a nerd. So it's okay. Yeah, she's just a nerd. Um, and another thing you have to be really careful of, in addition to all the military that has a lot of the desert occupied, is the Native Americans and their uh, land. That if you go on and you're not supposed to, they can do bad things to you. <laughs> Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and we have several meteorite sites we're aware of that, that are on Native American land. Mm-hmm. And it, we haven't even, you know, I mean, it, it would be disrespectful and possibly dangerous to just go. And so over the years, we've, we've worked on developing some contacts with Native Americans and, and and even said, look, we just would love the opportunity to search. And if if some some of your residents would like to go with us, we'll will let you have what we find. We just want the right. experience. We just want so, to be able to say that we found it. Yeah. And that's related to something else very interesting that happened when we were when we were filming in Utah. Because the, the military proving ground there is is off limits even to regular military, mm-hmm. the surface is untouched, except for where the bombs have gone off, of course. And <laughs> we found extraordinary Native American artifacts out there. Giant spear wow. points, arrowheads, and they were what we call pedestaled, and, and it's a geological term. When something's been on a on a dry surface like a lake bed for, for thousands of years, the, the wind erodes the sand away around the piece, and it's left on this little pile of sand. It's called a pedestal. And so we were, we photographed them, and we oohed and aahed over them, but we weren't even allowed to touch them. You know, it's federal land, so you, wow. you, you, can't, you cannot disturb the artifacts. But it was fantastic to see them. Wow. So you're you're going you're you're looking for things that are new and you're finding things that are old and you're having all these wonderful experiences and you've only written three books <laughs> actually i've only written two you've I'm, only written I'm, two and I'm, you started yeah, the third. I'm, I'm sorry i'm 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 in i'm in the early stages of of working on a on a third book which will be a collection of essays um science art and and travel essays I the, love it. Science, art, and travel together. So, well, this is one of one of the reasons like, like I like a fabulous trifecta right there. Yeah, <laughs> really. Well, this is one of the reasons I was so excited about doing the show because, okay, on the surface it's about meteorites, and then also it's about my my long and and fairly amusing relationship with my friend Steve, and we have very different views on politics and diet and everything, and. He's a wonderful family guy. He's married with kids, and I live on my own in the desert with my imperious cat. So there, there are all these character differences. So, so there's, there's a lot of humor and rapport uh, that goes on, or some might say needling. And then there's the travel on, because we, we've been to Australia and Russia, Poland, Sweden. We've crossed the Arctic Circle, been to some of the most remote places on Earth. And I love other cultures. I've, I've traveled to more than 45 countries and I love languages and and native custom and, and dress and, and traditional art. So for me, yes, we have the opportunity to go and look for meteorites, which is my passion. But we get exposed to so much else on the way. And so when I, when I was writing Rockstar, I didn't want it to just be a book about rocks that fell out of the sky. I, I wanted to show, I wanted to demonstrate why I find them so fascinating. 
and tell amusing stories from the road, of which there are many. We met some really wacky characters on our travels. When we were filming in Australia in the outback, again, it's a very remote place. It's, it's home to eight of the world's ten deadliest snakes. Right. <laughs> al- along with all kinds of other things that will bite you and kill you if they have half a chance. Not the Australians themselves. They're extremely, <laughs> extremely warm and welcoming people, and I, I loved every minute of my time there. But we were out in this, this very desolate area, and, and we were driving to the, to the spot where we were going to film, and there had been a heavy rains that week. And so just out in the middle of nowhere, we came across this guy on a tiny little dirt bike, a little off-road motorcycle, and he was stuck in this huge flooded wash so we had convoy of four vehicles and we had a medic and we had emergency rescue stuff and all that as we would so we get out and he's he's a young irish guy and we go hey uh, we'll give you a hand and he goes no no i'm fine i don't uh, i'm fine just go away i'll be all right <laughs> and and i and i said look i i don't i don't think so and um by the way my dad lives in dublin so i'm very irish friendly and you know we'll just give you a hand and he was very resistant. He goes, no, no, I'll get it out of myself. No, no, worry about it. But we were, he, I mean, he would have died out there. So we kind of mm-hmm. insisted and we dragged the bike out and, and we got him all together. And then he goes, all right, I'll be on my way then. And I kind of took him aside and said, you know, you could say thank you to the crew for rescuing you. And he goes, I'll tell you what, could you give me a beer? <laughs> and, and, and that was it. So instead of thanking us, we gave him a beer and, <laughs> so this is this is what happens in my life. I, I I meet a lot of really odd but but extremely memorable characters. And you have I really like to. I mean, it takes a lot of backbone to ride across Australia on your own on a teeny little dirt bike that looks like yeah. you couldn't make it down to the post office. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm hoping that you take a really good camera along with you on these things. Oh yeah, I'm a I'm a photography nut. And okay, good. But my, I'm like that would be such a waste if you didn't because I'm a photographer, and that's why I made the comment earlier. Um, and to go to all those places and not capture some, because you're going to places that are very raw yes. and untouched. And I always travel with at least two cameras. Right. And I, I'm, I'm a, yeah. And I'm a bit of a traditionalist and I, I do still love film and I love shooting 35 millimeter black and white, but it's very difficult to get it processed these yeah. days. Yeah. And you when we have your own little dark room now. I used to. And in fact, now I, I was talking to a friend of mine in California who's a photographer, and in California now there's a very strict ordinance regarding dumping of waste chemicals from yeah. dark room. So yeah, that's why become, I had to stop having a dark room. And, and rightly so. We don't want to be dumping all that chlorine into the water, but it makes it difficult. And so for I, I kind of – I have different – cameras that went on different expeditions with me and I go oh that one went to Russia and this one went to Chile and when we started filming season two I bought myself a Leica and I, I, I thought I'd treat myself I've always wanted nice. a Leica and it's the best camera I've ever owned and after doing well, I think we did 66,000 miles while filming season two and I photographed the whole thing with my Leica and then when I got back the lens had jammed and it wouldn't Aww. close properly so and no fault of Leica. So we so we we sent it back for a repair, and it came back with this very nice note. And the the, the tech said, oh, "Your camera's fine. We were able to salvage it. Don't worry." But there was a huge amount of sand in the mechanism. And may I respectfully suggest that you don't expose it to sand anymore? I mean, it is a Leica, and, and I laughed and I thought, "Yeah, you know, I would if I could, but I don't, I don't control where the meteorites fall." So. Well, if you could do that. <laughs> another uh, along those lines, again, the Antelope Canyon trip that I took, there were um, there is sand falling from within the canyon while you're walking through it, and I did see people that had plastic bags around their cameras or the underwater um, enclosure around their camera. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so that they could walk through and that they could point up. And there were at specific points where the Native American guides, you can't go there without a guide, where the guides would say, point your cameras down, you know, protect your lens, there's going to be sand in the air. And, you know, and then they would grab you and say, okay, the sun is coming through here just right. Everybody get over here and point your camera up, but, you know, protect your lens from the sand. So it's... Uh, yeah, I was worried when I got home from that trip. <laughs> well, that's very thoughtful, though. Photographer-friendly yeah. guides. I like that. Um, and it was amazing because uh, it's only a half mile long. 
And but I took 900 photos in that half a mile, um, and that's just walking through once and walking back once. And wow. um, I totally got separated from my group. My guide kept yelling at me, and she was, <laughs> because you can't go through that area without an Indian guide. And there was a group of like 15 of us, and you know she was like, "Where's my people?" <laughs> don't run up great. here. Do I have the same number of people I started out with? Oh yeah, they have to count everybody <laughs> and they have to, you know, they were sending people back to go find me and they were coming back when I was still going forward and you know, but it's it's a it's the type of thing that even if I went back another day, it's going to be t- totally different light. It's a, you know, the way the canyon is um in the, you know, in the earth, it's just It'll be totally different the next time you go through. Different time of year, different anything. You know, it'll have totally different lighting and the images will be totally different. Indeed. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned the the question about photography because when when I started deciding on the design and and format for for the new book, Rockstar, I, I had always envisioned it just as a memoir. And then I thought, no, I really need to put some photographs in it. And so originally I was going to have one of those inserts with the 16 pages of color photos in the middle. And I thought, I don't want to do that. I want mm-hmm. it to be more like an art book, like a picture book. Mm-hmm. So there are over 130 photographs in it, most of which are mine. And it, one of the most difficult tasks for me was narrowing down the photographs. I know. I, Isn't that horrible? Yeah. Like, it was, it was a fun so task, but a, but a difficult one. And so my, my team, my company, Aerolite Meteorites, would, would come in every morning for a period of several weeks. And there's just thousands of negatives all over the place and, and disks and hard drives and everything. Because a lot of – since it's a memoir, a lot of the photographs were taken on film. And I had yeah. to go and find the original negatives and do negative scans. And, and I, I've also worked much of my life as an art director and uh, specifically a book designer in my earlier years before I was a meteorite hunter. So I have very specialized knowledge and so was was able to shape the book to my vision rather than turning it over to someone else and going, well, I want it to be kind of like this or no, it's too big or it's too small. So I'm, I'm a very hands-on guy and I, I really like to have artistic control of, of my product. And as we mentioned earlier, I worked on it for 14 years, so I wasn't that keen on just turning it over to somebody else to oversee the design. So that's another reason why it took so long. It wasn't just the writing. It was the photo research, and then I'm a bit on the meticulous side. Some well, and that's, say. that's what you need to have in order to have the book be representative of your life. And it is, um, it's, it's an integral part of what you were doing and the adventures that you were on. And although we love writing and we love reading about adventures, but, you know, they say, you know, a photo is worth a thousand words. Well, you know, it can be the one thing that brings everything to life and it, and it lends to the authenticity And with today's um, sophistication in the readers and sophistication in the, um, you know, in in our society now, they they can hear the stories and they love to hear the stories, but then they're almost going to be like fairy tales to them because you're in such far out places that no one can envision them. And by including a photograph, you've just made it real and you've made it authentic. And that's, um, you know, that's an entirely different experience and it lends a lot of credibility to your book. Now I want to, not, not only do I want the book, I want the book and I want it autographed by you. (laughs) Oh, most definitely. But no, I, I'd be delighted. I, I should have. I should have thought to send copies to you in advance. And no, that's I'm sorry, fine. I, I'm just saying these are the types of books that I would read and that my kids would have enjoyed when they were young. Karen's kids would love them. And, you know, that's just um, that that's just awesome to be able to take the time. And you took a long time to put it together. So, yeah, it should be the way you want it. Now the question is, did you self-publish or did you get a publishing house to publish it? I actually own my own publishing company. There you I, go. I, ha- I have a small, I have a small independent publishing company called Stangate Press LLC, mm-hmm. and we're based here in Tucson. And Rockstar is the third book that we've published, and I, we've also been involved in the design of of many others. Mm-hmm. And I have been 
I've worked in the publishing industry for, for many years. I worked for, for a couple of major publishers in New York and London. And so I have a lot of knowledge of the business and I love the publishing business. But I'm, I'm also a musician and I've worked in the music business and I understand royalties and I understand that the up and coming authors are often not given much input by the large publishing companies having having witnessed this myself many times right so i didn't want to turn my work over to somebody else so i hired my own editors and my own proofreaders and i have a fantastic uh, print manager here and we have some distribution set up we sell the books on amazon and through our own websites and at readings and we do numerous gem shows and astronomy events around the country so it's been fantastically successful and i i do this out of love but publishing is a business as well and i thought i put all of this effort into the book if it's if it's successful i don't want to be getting a 7.5 percent royalty from one of the big publishers <laughs> No. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't, I don't think that's fair. And I, I've never thought that's fair. And I don't think no. royalties paid to musicians are fair either. No. Mm -hmm. And especially now, and we always hear, oh, you know, readings down and, and record sales are down. I'm sorry, but it's also a lot cheaper to print books now than it used to be. So I, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for all the moaning and groaning about how, how the business is not doing as well as it used to. And look at the, the prevalence of self-published authors and small presses promoting their works on the on the internet and through book fairs and I, I think that that technology's leveled the playing field a little bit in, in the arts. Yes. To the extent that people with the time and, and effort and a little funding can put out a book the the way they want. And and I'm a great supporter of self publishing. I, I think it's wonderful. I think everyone has a story to tell and, and those who, who really want to tell it and get it out in the world should have the ability to do so and they now they can. So we're we're a small publishing house, but I uh, it's it, it coexists with, with my other business, Aerolite Meteorites, which is our, our commercial meteorite company. And uh, the publishing company is my labor of love. I, I just I absolutely love working with books, with real books and um, we're we're just about to release EPUBs of both of my books as well, both the books I've written. And we have several other science books and a memoir and a, a, a couple of really exciting properties that, that we acquired, including a, a, or are hoping to acquire a, an historic science book that's never been published before. Wow. So there, there are exciting things happening. I'm intrigued. And I... I <laughs> I feel so lucky to be able to do this and, and it is partly a result of having worked in the publishing industry and having the experience as an art director and book designer but also again the technology now allows us to, to make beautiful books mm -hmm. for, for far less than it would have cost 20 years ago. Yeah, as a professional photographer, you know, I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of negatives and then after I switch to you know good digital I now have hundreds of thousands of images and uh, to uh, when I started looking at publishing books some fiction books last summer I you know the the Kindle fire was just coming out and you know I I uh, didn't think I would ever read a book on a on a reader but I had put the Kindle app on my MacBook Pro and I actually sat down in the you know recliner one night and uh, I was having some back problems and just wanted to rest and I read a novel and I was like okay I can read on if I can read on this anybody can read on this and then after I published some fiction and you know some transcripts of podcasts as self you know, contained books and some other things. I'll, uh, my boyfriend went out and, and got me a Kindle Fire, and I immediately put together a photography book and put it up as an ebook. And I'm like, wow, I can now get my photography out there in front of people in color, and they can actually see my photos. You know, it's not like it's the same as seeing them in a big book or on the wall, but they can see the beauty of my photography. And then I put off going to create space. I'm like, it's going to cost too much. It's going to cost too much. And yet I can do, you know, it's not top, top quality photography book, but for the average person, it is a an affordable and beautiful book that they publish. 
And I couldn't do that 20 years ago. And now, you know, I've got, uh, through the years, I've been sorting and separating the images. You know, the birds here, the cats there, the uh, wild animals here, and, you know, landscapes there, and the southwest, and whatever. And now I can do a series of photography books and either just offer them electronically or offer them both electronically and in print. And I'm able to suddenly share my body of work instead of having to keep it on my computer for nobody else to see. That's, that's really fantastic. I, I just love hearing stories like that. And, and I'm, I'm much the same way. And the, there is a joy in getting your personal creative project out into the world. Yep. And yeah, it's great if you can sell some copies and make some money. But I, I think it, it's, it's kind of an artist experience. I want to share my exactly. take on my, my life's journey with other people. and. Yep. It, it, yeah, if it becomes a bestseller, fantastic. If it yeah. sells a few thousand copies and, and makes a few thousand people engaged for a couple of days, that's also great. Yep. And, you know, it's very simple books. Like some of my books are for, they, I didn't make them with children in mind, but like one of my best selling books is, uh, it's 34 pages, and each page has a picture of a butterfly, and it tells the actual name of the butterfly, not just, you know, pretty orange butterfly. And it also has a quote or, um, or a short poem that are about butterflies. And so many people wrote me back after they bought that book and left me reviews because they were like, you know, I sat down with my granddaughter and went through it. I went through with my, you know, with my child or even I just sat there just because it's a, a nice little nugget to see. And, and they didn't know there were so many different butterflies in the world. And that was only 34 pages. I've got 10,000 other images that I haven't had time to put together yet. So it's just so exciting. It, it, to me, photography is to be shared. Art is to be shared. And and to me, if it's just sitting in my hard drive doing nothing, it's it's being wasted. No, it's beautifully said. It's, it's very poetic and it's very true. And I, I think we're we're very like minded in that. I don't I don't write these stories and I don't take these photographs to amuse myself. I was already exactly. there. Exactly. And I really enjoy. I'm a storyteller. I, I, if, if you, you go to a party with my friends and me at some point around one o'clock in the morning, Jeff will be sitting in the corner <laughs> relating some story about how we met this crazy Irish motorcyclist in Australia or one of a hundred others. And I, I really enjoy it. And I feel a kind of spiritual kinship to the storytellers of old be yes. before we had books and this concept of sitting around the campfire and, and, and entertaining. Mm -hmm. they, they were, in, in a sense... The, the novelists of their day, even, yeah. even though they, they weren't using the written word. Yep. So there, there is a sense of humor uh, in, my, in my writing and hopefully also a sense of adventure. And I, I try, it's, it's a very difficult line to walk when you're trying to explain why you feel so passionately about something. And it, it's so easy to kind of slip into using all these superlatives or slip the other way and getting too sentimental. And I, I worked, I worked hard on that. And I, I had this very interesting experience where th there's some of the editors and fellow writers that I was working with when I, when I was, when I was developing Rockstar said, Jeff, there's one thing that's missing from this book. There, there's no point when you really explain from your heart why you find meteorites so amazing. We've seen the journeys that you've been on. We've seen how excited you get when you find something important and the contributions to science and the television show and the rest of it. But where's the heart? Mm -hmm. So I sat down and I, I wrote a passage. It's only half a page, but it, it describes the journey that a meteorite goes on from its parent body in the asteroid belt through space, through our atmosphere, melting, changing its shape, and then falling perhaps in a desert or in a jungle somewhere and being found by someone later. And it, it's, I just inserted it into one of the chapters. It didn't, it's not the beginning of the book. And when, when the final manuscript went to a science colleague for, for review, she called and she said, you know what my favorite bit in the whole book was? This one paragraph. <laughs> and and I I find writing usually to be a very flowing 
process. And I, I had the pleasure of studying many years ago with, with Natalie Goldberg, oh, the, the writer from New Mexico. She's not only a great writer, but a, a really nice person and, a, and a, a brilliant person. And I took an extensive writing workshop with her in Taos many years ago. And you can imagine having grown up in the UK and gone to a very strict British public school and had lots of English literature and English language. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a grammar fanatic mm -hmm. and so I'm quite strict with myself on, on proper word usage and so forth. And so one of the things that would happen to me is I get bogged down. I'd be writing and I go, I'm not going to say it was sky blue. What's another good blue. What about Robin's egg blue? That sounds, that sounds no, I need something even more original than that. So I'd get stuck. I'd be halfway through a paragraph and I'd go, ah, oh, what's the right word there? And then I go, oh, lost my flow. I'm going to go make a cup of tea. So working with Natalie, she encouraged me to just get it all down. Yeah. Just put it down as quickly as you can and don't start agonizing about sentence structure and word usage and the rest of it. Get it down and then let it breathe for a couple of days and then go back and fix it up. And that works really well for me. I, I must say I've kind of, my writing process is somewhere in the middle because yeah. sometimes I'll, I'll write something and go, I just can't leave that word on the page. I have to, <laughs> I have to change that. But I, I really enjoyed working with her. Writing down and the bones is the one that got the me. Bones. That's the yeah. one that got me doing my first writing. And I have wild minds sitting right here on my desk. And I think that she wrote one about memoirs that I put on my Kindle that I yeah. haven't finished reading yeah. yet. I would recommend that book for any of your listeners who, who maybe feel somewhat disengaged from the process mm -hmm. of, of writing. It's a, it's a very uh, uplifting and supportive book. She's a very positive and encouraging person. And uh, it, it, was, it was very interesting for me because I was living in New York City at the time and, and I, was, I was doing science writing and I was doing some science fiction and, and went out to this very kind of almost hippie situation out in, in Taos and it was in, it was in February and it was extremely beautiful. There were crisp winter skies and there was frost on the ground and I, I found it a, a kind of a pivotal moment in my writing career because – one of our guest speakers during the workshop was John Thorndike, and nice. he's a novelist from Santa Fe who's written uh, several novels and, and two memoirs. And I hit it off with him immediately. He's, he's a really warm guy. He's a great writer. And we, we got talking after the workshop, and, and then we, we hung out a few times in Santa Fe and later in New York. And he said... I, I was actually quoting him earlier uh, unintentionally. He said to me, Jeff, everyone's got a story to tell everyone. And I had told him about my, my life as a musician and my, my work in science and all that. And he said, but your story is more interesting than most. Yeah, and, exactly. And you, sh you should do it. And at the time I was writing fiction primarily. Mm -hmm. And I had this sort of epiphany after, after working with Natalie for a while and then meeting John Thorndike and having this conversation with him, I just thought, what am I doing? Why am I writing fiction? I'm not a fiction writer. I'm a nonfiction writer. Get it together, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> or you and can, he, people, people will think you're writing fiction when you're really writing real life. Yeah, and that's, that goes back to your point about putting the photographs in because if I'm describing how bleak and scary some of these places are, people go, oh, he's just exaggerating. But yeah. then you see the photo and you go, oh, wow. There really is nothing out there. No <laughs> trees or birds or plants or anything. So, I, of course, it's obvious that, that we are influenced by writers whom we like. But here is an example of almost by accident, I met a writer that at the time I didn't even know. And he played a huge role in my life. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen him for years. I have to get back in touch with him and go, John, it's all thanks to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and Natalie, of course, because she because she invited him. But sorry, I got sidetracked. I, I was I was just commenting on the on her book, writing down the bones. It 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 took the anguish out of writing for me. Yeah, I thought it doesn't have to be that painful. You don't yeah. have to you don't have to get completely obsessed with the right word. Tell your story and then fix it later, as we say in television. We'll fix it in post. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also she allows you to um, and just exactly it sounds it is just exactly like it sounds 
writing down the bones tells you to take writing as a um, at, don't take it so seriously and just tell your story and it frees you from the grammar, the spelling, the structure, the genre. Don't worry about any of that. Just get the story out. And it might be on page 100 of your scribbling that you finally get to the story that you need to tell. But she said all the other stuff is in the way. And if you don't get it out, you're not going to be able to get to the story that you're meant to tell. Exactly. And it shows how easily confused I am. I, I remember vividly seeing that book in a in a shop in New York many years ago and I picked it up and I go, Oh, this looks interesting. And my initial reaction was the title meant writing down through the bones in your body as if it was a physical kind oh. of exercise that you would do. And then I read the book and I go, No, Jeff, you're such a nut. That's not what she means at all. <laughs> she means put down the framework of the story, <laughs> you goon. Yeah. And I think that's um, that's important for a lot of memoir writers, and um, it's it's really important for them to know that however they're writing their story, you know, for our listeners, however you're writing your story, there isn't a right way and a wrong way. What it is is that you just need to make sure that you get your story out, and that you then go through and refine it. And we've, we've, we've interviewed authors that have written 150,000 words, 200,000 words, and they've cut it back after they were done, you know, after they got everything out and they had all these words, then they were able to go through and take out the parts that didn't make any sense or that weren't necessary and condense it down, you know, to 50,000 words or 100,000 words. And it, it's just important to know that, you know, while you're getting all the stories out, if you don't get them out of your head... They're going to stay there niggling at you while you're trying to do all the other things. So once you empty them onto paper or into your computer, you know, then you will be able to find the way you'll you'll start your second digging through and you'll find your way through it. Very well put. And I think that also demonstrates the importance of having a good editor. Oh, and, totally. And, and we, we as writers, we go, oh, I know best. It's my story. No one's going to tell me how to write my story. But it's so easy to get bogged down. You go, well, I know what was happening. I was there. And then your editor reads it and goes, I have no understanding of how you got from Sweden to Russia. How did that happen? I go, oh, well, it's obvious. I flew, but it's not in the story. So the, and this, this process of editing and of us sometimes having to give up material that we've written, it can be very painful. And when my editor was going through through Rockstar, one of, one of the last chapters is called The Long Hunt. And it's about this this five-week period during which we filmed four episodes of, of the TV show, Meteorite Men, back to back in, or, in order to get done what we wanted with it within the budget. And we were in, we, we started in the States and we went to briefly to the UK and France, Finland, Sweden, across the Arctic Circle, Poland, went to Russia, went back to Poland and back to the States. And there was this, I thought, very funny passage where I'm describing all these things that went wrong during the flight. And there was this gigantic guy behind me and he took his feet, his shoes and socks off and put his feet up on the back of my seat. And he had huge smelly feet and it was just really um, quite unpleasant. And that was in business class as well, let me tell you. Imagine what it was like in coach. So I, I found it very amusing, and, and, my, and I had two editors work on the book, actually, and they both read it and said, you got to take that out. And I said, why? And it, it, they said, well, it sounds like you don't like the Poles. And I said, no, I love the Poles. Poland's one of the best countries I've ever been to. And they said, it comes off as very negative. And I read it, and I go, yeah, I guess you're right. And I just cut that whole part, because the last thing I want to do is insult my friends in Poland. Right, right. And what's really funny uh, to that story is that um, I, one of the very first interviews I did with an author, um, she had a beta reader that would sit in her house and read the book, you know, while they had tea or whatever, so that she could observe the beta reader while she was reading. And she had been reading a long time, and she hadn't laughed, and there was a part where she was supposed to laugh. So she, you know, asked the, the woman, did you, did you read th- this passage? And she goes, yeah. And she goes, well, you didn't laugh. And she said, well, it wasn't funny. And she says, well, yeah, it was. Go back. So she went back and she reread the the passage again. And she goes, that's not funny. She goes, darn, that was supposed to be funny. Oh, that's great. <laughs> You're not that's, laughing. <laughs> you know, and 
this is this interesting parallel. I really like to read my finished manuscripts out loud. Mm-hmm. I, mm. I find it I find it extremely helpful when when I think it's all done and it's been through editing and it's been to the copy editor and everything and I've had four different people proofread it because I'm obsessive. Then I, I will sometimes just ask my girlfriend if she would mind sitting on the couch and can I, I oh, look I've just finished this can I read this to you and she's very she's very patient with me and there there there've definitely been some moments where I'm 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 reading something I'm cracking up laughing and she's sitting there just barely cracking a smile and I go what, what don't you think it's funny and she goes no but you do you're clearly very amused <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say you looked over and she was sleeping <laughs> Uh, uh, mercifully, that hasn't happened yet. But that's, that's probably because I haven't read any of the strict science articles. Well, and um, it's interesting that you bring that up because it's been funny that in the last couple of weeks, um, all of a sudden I've, I've got writers that are asking me, you know, when I'm doing the interview, they're like, can I read a piece, you know, can I read a passage? And I'm like, well, certainly. So now I'm going to um, create a way that authors can uh, leave an audio passage. Uh, I have to figure out the logistics of it. I, I know how to collect it. I just have to figure out how to get it on the site the right way. Um, I, I, I want people that want to read some of their stuff and have it available online for people to listen to. I want to give those authors a place to do that. That is a fantastic idea. Well, and it came from my, I'm a big believer in give people what they want. And that's, um, that's how I build most of my businesses. And yes, I'm a serial entrepreneur and I have many different things that I do. And one of the things is we do a lot of podcasts on a lot of different topics. But as I'm listening to these authors, um, I've interviewed, you are like our 106th author that I have interviewed in the last five weeks. And Good Lord, what are you doing in your spare time? <laughs> That's really amazing. Um, it, it has been amazing. And the amount of knowledge that I'm getting from these people and the amount of experiences. And then I'm also listening to what they need because we'll be having a discussion and someone will say, can I read you a piece? And then you realize that, yes, a lot of fiction writers or, or writers in general want to be able they do readings in libraries and they do them in bookstores well they can't reach very many people when they do a reading in a library or a bookstore let's give them a place to do a reading online and it's the same thing with um you know having a place for people to post their book and get it out there that aren't a member of the you know they're not in the big publishing companies or they're not a top a top-rated author, and they're uh, somebody who needs some exposure for their book, even though it's a really good book. You need to get it out there in front of people, and a lot of people are thanking me for uh, using our website to do this. But it's it's all stem from the authors. You know, if authors didn't want to talk to me, I wouldn't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> Well, it, that's, it's very well put, but I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, it, it's yeah. almost like um, it would be like an artist, like a photographer putting a portfolio, putting a sample portfolio up on a on a collective website for photographers. Yeah. It's a super idea. I, I, I Don't take this the wrong way. I'm kind of amazed nobody's thought of doing that before. Well, and I am too. That's, that's why I – this is one of the things that, you know, things come to me while I'm talking to people – and yes, we're having a very long conversation, but I have a feeling that our listeners are fascinated and they're going to stick with us, you know. But in the meantime, Karen and I are having a great time with you, and I don't care how long it goes. Oh, thank you. Well, same <laughs> I, here. I, I hope your listeners aren't sitting around going, "Oh no, they no, don't have that British meteorite guy on again." He just goes on about so many different topics. Well, and that's the experience of having a discussion style interview as well, instead of. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of blogs and a lot of places where an author can go and fill out an interview form and they'll post up your interview and a link to your book. And, you know, I like hearing voices. I like having discussions. And when people listen to our podcast, it's like they're eavesdropping on a conversation. Um, mm. You know, not to compare myself to, to someone who's so good, but I see it as the Phil Donahue. You know, he used to have discussions instead of being the straight up, 
you know, here's the questions I'm going to ask. You have the prepared answers. You know, I've had people that I'm interviewing ask me for the list of questions so that they can prepare their answers. And I'm like, we're going to talk yeah, about no. your book. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think that's, about that's you. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and people getting to know other people is how we, this is how we decide on our purchasing, you know, and this is how we decide what we want to watch on TV. You know, a friend told us to watch this. A friend told us to listen to this. A friend told us to read this book. Now, someone will search for your name and find this podcast and they'll go, I want to read his book. I want to watch his show. What channel is it on in our house? Well, the other thing is, is especially with, with, you know, with at least my my own book purchases, I mean, good nor, goodness knows we have we have enough um, paper around here to I don't know probably fell half the Pacific Northwest, but um, the for me purchasing a book is not just purchasing a book and a story. It's also you know who's the author? Mm-hmm. You know what did they do? You know do they have authority? Yeah. You know because I mean I like reading historical fiction. There's a lot of historical fiction out there right now, and a lot of it is crap. Yep. Because, you know, yeah, sure, you can go to a, a library and look up in those ancient encyclopedias, you know, Henry VIII, and you can write a book. But unless you have a lot of the nuance, then to me, it's it's not interesting. You don't have the authority to be writing on the topic. You know, and, and for, someone, for someone like you who has so much authority about this topic that can, you know, can not only express it, you know, in scientific terms, but can also make it a fun and interesting read, to me, that is so much more compelling as a purchase than just, you know, well, let's buy a book about meteorites. Yay. You know, it's, it's <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that's, that's boring, you know, that's like that's like a 30 page book (laughs) you know you want something that meatier than that and and so for me having a a conversation about you know your experience not only as a writer but also as a person um to me that's much more interesting well thank you that's that's a it's a very kind compliment and 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 much appreciated i i did wrestle at times with the book because I thought, well, am I getting a bit personal here talking about my motivations and my, the, some of the initial failures on expeditions and, and, and the determination that it takes to go to these places and just stick with it. And my, my verdict was, no, it's not too personal. I, I'm, I'm try to be a very honest writer and not to exaggerate and not, I, I definitely don't make things up. Of course, we all take a bit of license. You have to, because you're, you're relating the events from your own unique perspective mm-hmm. and, and you are through the lens of your own eyes and your consciousness and, and your vocabulary. Right. And I, I should probably mention that it's not just a book about rocks. It's also a book about rock and roll. Hence the name. Oh, I, I had I, a feeling. <laughs> well, I've, I've had a kind of a very interesting parallel life. And I worked as a professional rock and roll musician for over 25 years in, wow. in the States and in, and in the UK. And I've played with a lot of really famous people. And the singer in my very first band back in the punk years in London, of course, we did start when we were very young, was the famous science fiction and fantasy author Neil Gaiman. Who, who remains one of my closest friends, and he wrote the introduction for Rockstar no, to wow. Rockstar for me. And I, Neil's, uh, as you know, a very famous writer and immensely successful and, and a screenwriter and, and a wonderful author. And I was very hesitant to bother him about this because I know he's much in demand as a screenwriter and a director and everything else, and he's very busy. And then I thought, Neil is the only person who can do it. Because he was really was with me at the beginning. We met when we were 10. Nice. We went all through British school together. We formed a band together. We both worked in the comics industry. And now we're both professional writers. And, and he, he very graciously agreed to, to do it. And it's a beautiful introduction. Of course, it's the best thing in the book because he's just an amazing writer. And there's a very funny part where he talks about when we used to be in the band together. And, and he said, no recordings from that era survive except possibly in Jeff's archive somewhere. And I like to think that if I get this introduction to him on deadline, that's where they'll remain. <laughs> so <That's nice>. they're, <laughs> they're, they weren't that bad really but it was our first band so it wasn't that great either but there is, there's a musical thread that runs through the book because I, I was working professionally as a musician and playing all the big clubs in New York and London and elsewhere and at the same time 
I have this fascination, some might say obsession, with space rocks, and I would periodically take off into the wilds. And that was, that was very vividly demonstrated in 1997 when I was recording my second album with Latch at LACH. He's a very famous New York singer-songwriter who now lives in Scotland, and, and he's been an influence on Michelle Schacht and Beck and Moldy Peaches and a lot oh of gosh, major, I've major never, artists. I've never heard anyone else mention Michelle Schacht before. Oh, well, so <laughs> You were so we, awesome. <laughs> Oh, she's fantastic. We we played with her. She we I Did mean I haven't seen her in years, but but um, we were certainly acquaintances, and and, and uh, Latch, my singer, and her were very good friends. And yeah, we did a few shows with her. I, I really I really like her both as a person and, and an artist. So oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so, so my story is about a guy who loved science when he was a kid and became a rock and roller, and then came back to science, and and there was always this kind of gentle friction between the two lifestyles and and i'm playing in this in this rock band in new york and we're recording albums and doing big concerts and and then i'd go on an expedition and my bandmates would go oh jeff's gonna go out and look for rocks again he's such a nerd (laughs) (laughs) so so the, the early chapters of the book are about the beginnings of the punk rock scene in london and the music scene in new york in the 80s and a lot of these interesting people that i met and each chapter begins with a with a lyric, with a quotation of lyrics. And rather than do the conventional thing and go and get, oh, let's see if I can get permission to use my favorite Beatles lyric and my favorite Clash lyric or whatever, I went back to my old bandmates, going back to the 70s, and asked permission to quote lyrics from songs that they had written and that we had written together. Mm. And so each one of those little quotes hopefully quotations, I should say, I'm going to use proper word usage, hopefully illuminates the chapter that, that follows. And, and there's a cyclical theme in, in the book, and music reappears, and a, a, a friend who is a very pivotal character in my music career came back into my life decades later, kind of by accident. And so after working on the television show and having all these adventures, there's music in my life again, and my house is full of guitars and and I actually still play occasionally with, nice. with that. Nice. So I, I thought it was, if it wasn't for that, I thought it might have been a bit grandiose to name the book Rockstar Adventures of a Meteorite Man, but it's a joke because I was a rock and roller. And then I became best known for going out into the boonies and finding strange rocks. Which are so, pieces of stars. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> so, well. Yeah. More precisely, asteroids, but they certainly do. Some of them do contain star material. You're absolutely correct. They all look the same up in the sky. (laughs) When they're falling, they definitely do. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So, well, this has been an awesome conversation. I am just like, Karen and I are going to come to Tucson and, uh, we're, and her <laughs> husband Go Joel, to the observatory. We're going to go to the observatory <laughs> and then you guys are going to jam because Karen and her husband both play musical, you know, music. You, what is it? I, opera I, I, singer? I never, yeah, I've, I've never done, yeah, it's, it's soprano, oboe, and, and guitar. I don't know. Do they make pieces like that? <laughs> wow, that's a stupid so, some, some sort of Philip Glass thing? I don't know. <laughs> Actually, if I may, I will tell you one more very brief story. Go right which ahead. Just, just reminded me of that. A, a, a great friend of mine is Jeffrey Cotton, and he's a contemporary classical composer and mm-hmm. also an artist, and he's a wonderful guy. And we, we used to live in the same building in, in the New York area. And, and he lives in Philadelphia now, and I'm out here in Arizona, but we've, we've stayed very good friends. And he, he's an amazing composer. And there, there are not many youngish people who, today who are composing original classical pieces. Yeah. And so he, he, he's great friends with, with the artistic director at the Tucson Symphony Orchestra here in Tucson. And so I, I would still see him. He'd come out to visit. And it so happened that I was traveling. And he said, well, Jeff, I need a quiet place to write. I think I'm composing this new piece um, for violin and something I haven't really decided. And why, why don't I house sit for you while you go off on your adventure to wherever? And it'll be nice and quiet. And then I'll come back. You'll come back and I'll have my piece finished and, and it'll be good. And I go, great. That sounds fantastic. So I, I collect weird musical instruments. I have a lot of strange hobbies. And uh-huh. one, of my, one of my favorite things is a waterphone. And it's a percussion instrument that was invented by uh, a, whole, uh, a 
an adoptee of Hawaii. I, I should say Richard Waters is originally from California. And if you heard the sound that it makes, you would immediately know, you would immediately recognize it because it's used in, in film soundtracks, uh, science fiction and horror films. And whenever there's a creepy moment, there's a kind of, ee, this kind of screechy sound. It kind of almost sounds like bells falling down the stairs or something. Anyway, the water phone is the instrument that makes that sound. So Jeffrey's staying here and he's looking at the, at the water phone and, and he goes, well, what the heck is that? And I said, it's a water phone. Let me show. And he goes, oh, that's how they make that sound. I always wondered. And he goes, Let, give me that. I want to play that. So he then completely changed his concerto and it became concerto for water phone and violin. Yeah. And, and they performed it. They, it was premiered here in Tucson and they flew in this famous percussionist from Eastern Europe and they used my water phone for the whole thing. So, sorry, this is a very long way of demonstrating that if you want piece written for soprano oboe guitar i think jeffrey cotton's the man to do it <laughs> he's very talented can i just tell you um karen shot me the wikipedia for a water phone and i just have to tell you that they actually uh, uh, this tell this shows you that i watch either a and e or history i don't know what channel it's on um, um uh, oh it's storage wars on storage wars they actually found one of those in a in a storage locker once and, no way. Yeah. And they were like, you know, astounded that they had actually found one of these things. And he took it to, you know, to an appraiser or whatever. And I don't remember what it was worth. But he was like, yeah, this is this is a musical instrument. And as soon yeah, as cause I, they couldn't figure out what it was, I remember that. Yeah. There was like, what is so it? Cool. I don't know. And but they, theirs ended up being a replica. But it was oh. actually, he said it was, you know, based on, and in the seventies, you know, it was something that, that they had, uh, found in the seventies. So yeah, that's wow. awesome. Well, that's, that's interesting for, for two reasons. One, um, I, I know some of the cast from some of the hosts from storage wars and oh, we did neat. a couple of, sh- we did a couple of shows together last oh, nice. year in, in Los Angeles no and it was, the, it was the funniest thing. We were, um, we were, doing a, a panel at this at this convention called reality rocks in um in los angeles mm-hmm. and so i i was there with um uh with joe madalena from from uh, hollywood treasure and uh various other uh uh gary, uh, gary summers from antiques roadshow and mm-hmm. and and the storage wars guys and so i go oh wow they're giving this panel with all these fantastic people so excited and um so the the first thing that that happened well it was so it was Dan and and Laura Dotson the the auctioneers and mm-hmm. Dave Hester of course who's fantastic uh, guy. He's, yeah he's so he's so entertaining <laughs> so we all we kind of get up on stage and, and we're all introduced and I so I'm sitting there's uh, there's Dan and then Laura and then Dave and then me and then Gary from Antiques Roadshow and and Joe from from Hollywood Treasure so we all get introduced and then and then. Laura leans over and she goes, oh, my God, I just have to tell you, I'm such a big fan of your show. And I go, no, I'm such a big fan of your show. I'm just psyched to be on the stage with you. And she goes, no, no, we're just so psyched to be doing this with you. And we, we're just all laughing because we were just we were everyone there, everyone in the panel knew each other's shows. Yeah. And it was a very kind of amusing <laughs> Uh, well, and Antiques Roadshow is fascinating, and you know, oh, that's funny. Storage Wars is fascinating, and the I only want the only one I don't know who is the first person you said. So, so Joe Madalena, he's yeah. a he's a fascinating gentleman. He owns a company in um, in Calabasas Hills, outside of LA, called Profiles in History, and they specialize in finding movie props, authentic movie and television oh, props, nice. costs. and the the show is called Hollywood Treasure. And it's it's one of my I don't watch much television. It's one of my one of my favorite shows. And I actually went out to L.A. a few weeks ago with with my girlfriend to one of their auctions because I'm a huge movie fan. And one of my hobbies is collecting science fiction props from movies, TV shows. So we we went out to their offices and we had this private tour. And you will thoroughly appreciate this. They had the Chewbacca's head, his original <laughs> head from, from the Star Wars movies. Nice. All the costumes from X Men, Professor Xavier's chair, one of the one of the ships from Aliens. I mean, it, it just it went on forever. Uh, all these astonishing Catwoman's Michelle Pfeiffer's original Catwoman costume. Nice. And, <laughs> and I I was just like a child who'd had too much candy i was so excited going look at this oh there's the, there's Worf's 
Batleth from Star Trek, and there's this, and there's that. So <clears throat> my girlfriend, Libby, I think she was afraid they were going to have to carry me out on a stretcher. I was so excited. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That's really cool. I, I know I know a couple, oh gosh, it's probably many more years ago than, than I I, I remember, I thought it was a couple years ago, but I think it was back in like 2005 or 2006. I know there's a whole bunch of things that came up for auction um, at Christie's from Star Trek. And um, I'm a big, you know, Star Trek fan, you know, John Yay. Picard and all that stuff. You know, he's cute. Um, but it, they they had one of his, um, the, the prop flute, um, the Resican flute, um, <laughs> they had that for sale. And they originally had estimated it to be about 300 bucks. And I'm like, are you serious? Only 300 bucks <laughs> for the Resican flute? I'm so in. <laughs> you know, like, I'll this take is, two. This is, this is like a good price range. Okay, fine. And it ended up going for $48,000. <laughs> Good wow. Lord. And that, I'm like, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> that's from that amazing episode, The Inner Light of yes, Next Generation. Yes, right? Which was, was, it's like one of my what? favorite episodes. It was oh, yeah. So good. It, it was one of the most moving pieces of television I've ever seen. It, right. If I'm not mistaken, I think Jonathan Frakes directed that episode. Oh, I don't know. I'm I'm not sure what, what, you know who who directed it, but I know it was just it was such a a poignant episode and then, you know, gosh, when was that? 95 ish maybe um oh it was probably earlier than that i don't know I'm, all my dates are kind of smushed in the middle there but um you know especially nowadays with with the if you're familiar with the episode you know great if you're not basically um it's it has to deal with a dying world and uh, the fact that that they've basically burned off their atmosphere and everybody dies of of exposure um you know and and all the the concept of you know having to wear your hat and wearing your sunscreen and things like that, and we're kind of doing the same thing. <laughs> so it, it's it's a very interesting episode, and it, it's just so gorgeous. It was so well done um, that I just really love it. Bless you. Sorry. It was super. You know, I've discovered this new thing called the internet, and you can look up almost anything on it. And it was um, it was 1992 actually oh, that episode. See? And I, I was mistaken. I, I beg your pardon. It was Peter Lauritsen who, who directed okay. it. But Jonathan Frakes, who played Riker in the shows, you know, directed mm-hmm. some of the other best episodes. But I thought that shows you what television can be. Mm-hmm. It was so beautifully directed. And it was such an original and thoughtful story. And I mean, the, I'm not sure devastating is the right word or even shocking. But the, the, the ending is so unexpected. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I just thought about it for days, and it's very unusual for something on television to have that kind of impact on me. Mm-hmm. And right. without without sounding grandiose, I hope I strive to put that kind of feeling into my writing. Not that I feel I could ever write a story as amazing as that, but it's it's the caring and the originality, and and it comes back to heart. There there was so much heart in that story it, it was right. it was moving and it was passionate without being sentimental and that's good writing mm-hmm. and you know you say you don't think that you could write to that level but you're writing your own story your own way and he he's writing the stories that are moving you but your story will be moving other people well thank you i appreciate that and it's very important that that we as writers don't overly compare ourselves and and i i love george orwell and i love hemingway and and some of the classic science fiction writers and and it's easy to read something go oh god i could never write something as good as that but you can it's Mm -hmm. just it it would be different and we i i also really believe in in, in the adage that, that we are what we eat. And so if, if you read a lot of good fiction or you read a lot of good nonfiction or whatever your discipline <clears throat> is, that feeds your inner writer. We, there's nothing wrong with being influenced. We've all been influenced by people. Yeah. But to, to not be influenced by another writer, you could in fact not be a writer because you would live up, grow up in a cave and you wouldn't know how to write. <laughs> That's a very so good I, analogy. I, and it's it's fine to to admit that we that we've had these um, influences. I love Douglas Adams. I think Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is one of the funniest and most brilliant things ever written. <laughs> and <clears throat> I I I hesitate to say this because it sounds like I'm blowing my own horn, and I'm I'm really not. But but I got a comment about my new book, and someone wrote and said, 
it was the best and funniest book I've read since, since Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I wrote back and said, you're my favorite person in the world right now. That's probably the <laughs> nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. But you know what? He didn't, he, there, he wasn't emulating someone else when he wrote it. And, you know, Hemingway just did his own thing. And they didn't become successful in classics overnight. You know, I mean, they were things that um, hit the heartstrings of people for many generations, and that's how they became a classic. You know, yes. Harry Potter is a classic because it came along at the right time, and she wrote about a world that was full of all these wonderful and magical things in a time where people weren't feeling like the world was all so wonderful and magical. And, you know, you, you comparing yourself to someone else is not... Not allowed. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just not, not allowed because you're you. It isn't productive, right? Yeah, it's not productive, and you have your own. That's like I have a story to tell. I haven't told it yet. I have a story to tell. I know that I'm going to. Um, I've gotten to the part where I know I'm going to be dictating it into a microphone because I can talk better um, and more focused than what I can write. And I think that the whole reading things aloud type of thing, you know, telling, we're storytellers. And I'm one of the people that is a storyteller, not necessarily a story writer. And I'm a photographer and an artist with a, with a camera, but as much as I would like to draw, I can't. You know, I'm, I'm a horrible, if I try to use paint or whatever, it's, it's just a mess. And knowing that you are a storyteller that can put it in writing, you've already jumped two big hurdles. And you've written fiction, and now you're writing nonfiction. You're, you're already ahead of, a, uh, ahead of the game. And you already know your voice because you are a natural storyteller from your experiences in your life. And that makes you unique from anybody else that tries to, even if, you're, even if your buddy Steve tried to write them, he would not write them the same way. That's very true. And actually, he's been, he's been so complimentary about my work. And, and we, we didn't even talk about my first book, but maybe next time. It, it's, it's called Meteorite Hunting, How to Find Treasure from Space. And oh, so that, that's a kind of, it's a hands-on guide for people who, who have become interested in our work and go, wow, well, I want to go out and find one of those space rocks for myself. So Steve wrote this wonderful back cover blur for me. And, and he, he teases me a lot on the show because I'm a vegetarian and, he, and he's the exact opposite of vegetarian. Mm -hmm. He'll have a, a hamburger and, and a full plate of ribs and ask for bacon on the side. <laughs> so... So he, he's, there, there's a bit where he talks about how if you enjoy Jeff on the show Meteorite Man, you're going to love this because it's all him. There's no inter me interrupting him with offers of beef jerky and other <laughs> things. It's just him waxing eloquence about the thing he cares about most in life, and that's space rocks. That's awesome. So we have a, we have a great relationship. You know, it's 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 fantastic to have solid friends in, in, in your life who are there that you, you can lean on and get support from. And, and, and Steve's not a writer, but he's a very smart guy. And I sent him both the books before they were published and said, let me know if there's anything you don't like, because he's a major character in both books. Right. Or if, if there are any mistakes as a courtesy. And he sent me, he's, 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 he's really, he's a very clear thinker. And he sent me quite long emails and he goes well here are all the things I've there wasn't, he, there wasn't anything he didn't like he didn't want me to change anything he just goes well this is an accurate and this meter actually fell in this year and I go god it's so good that I've got these people in my <laughs> life that can help me fix these things because the worst thing is when you publish something and then you get an email or a letter from someone saying well I really enjoyed your book but on page 42 there's this bit where you calculate the mass and your math was off yeah and that's actually. And you know they will because the people. Who <laughs> I know they will because it's happened to me. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> well, and you know your thing about music and and writing and being a scientist and a mathematician. I know a lot of musicians that are, you know, whether they like it or not, they are very math oriented or science oriented. And music, you know, music and writing are both an art and a science. You know, there's there is a chemistry in both of them, and it's not explainable. You know, I mean, you you can't always explain why a certain song is a big hit, 
and you know something. Do you know that there actually is a group that has taken? Um, I cannot remember the name of the project right now, but I could probably ask Joel. Um, and my husband is, is also a musician, and, and we stumbled across this probably six months ago. There's actually a group that has taken like the the last you know 500 top songs or whatever from from the last hundred years, and has um, done an analysis of them. You know, transposed everything into the same key and done an analysis of the chord progressions, and they can now. Almost, almost accurately predict what songs are going to be hits. Wow. Okay, that's scary. <laughs> Isn't that scary? <laughs> that I, sounds but, like but that's, it, it's math because you know, and 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 anyone who's ever tuned a piano will tell you that you know there there is definite science in music because you can't have one without the other. Um, you know, you've got all this overtones and the progressions and and just the distance between between your your notes and your melody. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're if you're in a major or a minor or a Lydian or Mixolydian scale, it doesn't matter. You know, there is there is going to be science between that because um, it's just part and parcel to the art form itself. Oh, agreed. I'm I'm just kind of slightly scared but not a bit surprised that there's a group that's been analyzing this and, and that sounds like a star, like a star trek episode written by george orwell and just <laughs> captain's log we're visiting a planet where the entire population is forced to listen to manufactured hits <laughs> they're they're They've come there back lies back the danger now <laughs> don't overanalyze it you either know. like the song or you don't right yeah, and, well, and and it's you know it, that's the way it's, it, it's always been with music though you know you've got you've got your you know your top hit you know top of the pops or the you know, your top forty but there's always the song that has the amazing lyrics and the interesting you know unexpected you know lyricism that is going to catch somebody's eye and that's their favorite song um, you know you're not always going to to like call me maybe or you know <laughs> whatever but. Um, yeah, and and music is is a personal preference. And even though you like the way Iggy Pop sings, you may not want to see him with his shirt off at a concert in London these days. <laughs> I, you know, he still looks pretty good. I, I, I don't know. He's got all these weird. We were watching a concert last night on TV, and he has all these weird little bumps all over, all over his chest. And I'm like, okay. And they actually like pulled him out of the crowd. He like wanted to lean into the crowd, and he had like two security guys behind him that were like they had a platform that was up to the crowd and they actually reached out and grabbed him and wouldn't let him go into the crowd they were afraid they were going to take him off on a you know what do they call that crowd surfing or whatever right Mm -hmm. he they were afraid he was going to do that and they like pulled him back and made him go back on stage but he still sounds great the music oh yeah well and i i have to say there there are not too many men in their mid-60s that would still feel comfortable with taking their shirt off on stage so right so I, I, I now Bruce him Springsteen. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind if Bruce Springsteen took off his shirt. Yeah, see, Springsteen never did it for me. And he never, but he never takes it off. He's just so energetic. He's so full of energy. And again, it goes to you know magicians, writer, musicians, writers, or whatever. They have so much energy, and you know the ones that are doing it because they enjoy it. So like Bruce Springsteen, he doesn't have to have another concert in his life. He didn't have to do the keynote for South by Southwest. He is not a person who needs to do anything else in his life to make money, he, but he does this because he loves it, and his band loves it, and they attack every performance like it's their only performance. Right. And he said that um, in an interview or something because he said, the people in the audience have never seen me before. They don't want just mm-hmm. a you know canned performance. They want me to give my 100%. Every time I get out there on stage, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I went to I went to a concert on Saturday and uh, saw America and Three Dog Night and oh my um, God. you know and well in Three Dog Night they've been touring for I think they said forty three years and America's yeah. been touring for forty one and wow. the the guys from America said you know what here here's the deal we're gonna make you you know is that as long as you keep coming we'll keep, keep touring playing. because we That's love great. it and and they've he said that you know they've toured every year for forty one years with one hundred and twenty shows or more every year it's like that's amazing dude can, when do you sleep yeah wow. <laughs> it's like that's that's incredible so yeah you can definitely tell when somebody loves loves something and obviously you love meteorites which is super cool so. i do and i love writing and i love being on your show 
This is it's so enjoyable. <laughs> I think we're going right. to have to have you back because we just keep talking. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're going to schedule another two-hour block with you. Um, <laughs> we've, we've been talking for an hour and a half, and I oh don't mind goodness. at all. And I think our listeners will be the same thing. They'll be listening, and they'll look at the clock and go, wow, I've been listening that long. This is great. And um, I, I totally uh, – I, we should wrap this up because we don't want to put people to sleep. Um, Agreed. <laughs> what? Agreed. I said. You know, we, you know, as 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 a rock and roller, I have to say, you always want to leave the audience hungry for a little bit more. A little bit more. Yes. <laughs> don't don't give them too much in the encore. And um, so, where now? Tell people where they can find you on the television, and then tell people where they can find you on the internet. With pleasure. My television series is called Meteorite Men, and you can see us on Science Channel and Science Channel HD in the States and on Discovery Science Networks worldwide. And I would encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about the show or meteorites to visit us at meteoritemen.com, which is really easy. And you can also order both of my books from the website. They are Meteorite Hunting, How to Find Treasure from Space. And the new one, my memoir, Rockstar Adventures of a Meteorite Man, also both available on Amazon. And my name is Jeffrey Notkin. And of course, it's the British spelling. Readers of Jeffrey Chaucer will recognize it instantly. Uh-huh. G-G-O. Wow, superb. <laughs> She's good. <laughs> and I'm very active on Facebook. I'm uh I'm facebook.com slash space rocks. You guessed it. Space rocks. Okay. Space rocks. Fantastic. Yeah. Or do a search for Jeff Notkin and if any of your listeners would, would like to drop a hello or find out more about what we do or my books. I'm I'm very active on social media. I'm I'm a bit of a computer nut, so we're on we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, and Google+, Plus, all as Meteorite Men. Wow, cool. Fantastic. Very cool. When I figure out which, which email I'm going to use for Google+, Plus, I'll start ramping it up. <laughs> my, yeah. uh, my, my boyfriend is also a photographer, and he follows all these really great photographers on Google+, Plus, and they have Google Hangouts with, you know, great photog- photographers from New Zealand and the UK and you know, all these other people. And he recently did a photo walk because the guy from New Zealand was flying to New York for one day to do a Google Hangout from lower Manhattan while taking what ended up being about 300 to 500 people on a photo walk through lower Manhattan. And they converged on uh, Ducati Square. And, like, all the cops were like, what are all these people with cameras and tripods doing down here? Is there a new thing we didn't get told about? <laughs> and it was because, you know, that's where the uh, the Wall mm-hmm. Street thing was. So oh, uh, right. Occup- Occupy Wall Street was down there and the cops were just like, ah. Not again. <laughs> and one of the. Oh, no. Of, we're just one, photographers. Don't worry. We're not demonstrating. <laughs> right. And one of the photos that, that Vinny actually got was. You know, the crowd was turned all one way listening to um, Trey, the, the guy from Trey Radcliffe, who was the, the, main, the guy who came in from New Zealand. And um, he turned around and in the, in the doorway of the Civic Building was our ex-governor, David Patterson. And he took a photo of a photographer behind him and David Patterson and then he took a second photo of David Patterson who is supposed to be blind and he waved to Benny (laughs) and Benny's like okay well I didn't make noise or anything so I think he can see me standing here (laughs) maybe he's maybe he's got secret psychic powers yeah yeah something like that so but it was that was one of Benny's favorite photos from the walk and oh, um, along with all the, you know, sunrises and their sunsets, they were there at sunset. So mm-hmm. anyway, another little piece of um, hopefully useful information about Google Plus is that you can hook up with people all around the world. And when they come to your city, you can meet them. Um, so, uh, Karen, where can people find you on the Internet? Oh, they can find me online on Pinterest. Um, I am Karen Garcia. I think I'm Karen Garcia. Am I something different? 
You, you, you surprised me with that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I figured I'm it was Karen that M. Anyway. Garcia. There we go. I'm Karen M. Garcia. I got to have that middle name in there. Uh, and then I am on Twitter also at Karen Garcia. You can find me either place. Awesome. And for those of you listening on iTunes or in a podcatcher or Google Reader, we're noticing an upsurge of people listening from Google Reader. Um, you can come to bookgoodies.com, B-O-O-K-G-O-O-D-I-E-S.com. And you can do a search for uh, Jeffrey, or and you will find, or do a search for Meteorite Men, and you will find the link to this podcast and the show notes, which will have a lot of the uh, links to things that we talked about during the show. And we would also invite you to leave your comments on the show, or you can also leave your comments uh, privately by going up to the top of the page and clicking the Contact Us button. And if you have a message for Jeff or a message for Karen or a message for me, you can, you know, just let us know. And you can also suggest uh, future topics that you want to hear authors talk about or have us find people to discuss if you have a a challenge in your writing that you want to uh, overcome or if there's someone you want us to, to try and contact to get on the show. And you can also, if you've written a book, you can click on Tell Us About Your Book, and we will put your book information up on your on our website at no cost because we just want people to share good reading and let everybody have a chance for promotion. And uh, we are also available on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest at slash book goodies. And I want to thank uh, both... Jeff and Karen for being here for this lovely extended podcast and I know that I could talk for another hour (laughs) (laughs) and uh, we will certainly get Jeff to come back on so thank everybody for listening and follow your dreams sit down and start writing and have a great day